I'd like to introduce Florian Frick from Cornell University and he'll be speaking to us today on topology and combinatorics of fair division. Thank you, Florian. Henry, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for having me at this uh, seminar. I think that's a great idea. And uh, unfortunately, it collides with our in-person topology seminar here at Cornell. But oh, and I've been watching some of the videos that you that you line. Great. So let me talk about topology and combinatorics of of fair division. And, and please interrupt me with questions or comments. Um, as far as I understand, you just have to you know unmute yourself and make enough noise to be louder than I am. And, and all you do. Um, so let me use uh, the problem of fair division. What kinds of problems do we want to talk about? So there's one in fair division that's high plane mass partitions. And, and this the the central theorem in, in, in high plane mass partitions, namely the, the Hodge theorem of Banach and Steinhaus. So give D masses on R D then affine hyperplane, meaning it doesn't go through zero. It's it's it has convention one, doesn't have to go through zero. That bites all masses. So the half space positive side of H, H has an orientation, and the half space on the negative side of H, they have the same mass for all the measures. And and what I mean by mass masses, mass are probability measures. So the measure is one. Every hyperplane has measure zero. That just ensures that uh, the measure of a half space continuously depends on, on the hyperplane. So, guess what's the next natural thing to ask? Well, how about more more hyperplanes? So, if you have, let's say masses and, and k hyperplanes, now you want to equip j masses by k hyperplane, where equipart means well, k hyperplanes determine two to the k orthons. Some of them might be empty, but we don't namely we want every orthon has the same measure. That's good. so. And here's so the um, input is j and k, and the is is the dimension. What's the lowest dimension? Where this equipartition result is possible, so that's one of the problems of of fair division. Here's a, here's another one. Um, you've stolen a necklace, yeah. and it has valuable beads, say rubies, uh, uh, and sapphires, and just piece of lead maybe, and partitions necklace in such a way that everyone one gets the same amount of every kind of stone. So as few cuts as possible of the necklace, and a few as places as possible, and divide among the thieves of the necklace in such a way that everyone gets the same amount of each stone. So here, for example, um, here's a division of this necklace into three parts and eight cuts. So here are the eight cuts, and here this goes to thief one, this to thief two, and this to, to the third robber, and everybody gets two of each kind. Yeah. In this situation, it's simple to see that you need eight cuts for some configurations. Right? For example, just just all stones, just put first the sapphires, then the rubies, then the emeralds, then the pieces of lead, and we'll have to cut each iteration consecutive equal zones three times. So you will need, uh, sorry, two times. So you will need eight cuts. Now, is, now is, is that true in general? Will you always, will eight cuts always suffice? So in general, for K thieves and Q kinds of stones, true that K minus one times Q cuts all suffice. And this actually is true that the groundbreaking work of Noga Alon from 1987 that every old necklace, open here meaning unclasped, types of beads, where number of, of each type is divisible by K, K 
translated into among these thieves in this fair manner, uh, using at most K1 times Q cuts. Yeah, so while the combinatorial theorem, the, the topological, um, you can, for example, deduce in the topological Treiberg theorem this, this result. Right. So, what questions that you can ask here? What what what, what else we are interested in? Here? For example, somehow constrain uh, which parts are adjacent. So here, the every two thieves have adjacent parts in this division. Can we now ensure that perhaps thief at one and three never have adjacent parts in a division? That's, that's one one question you can you can ask here. Okay. Here, here's a third problem in fair division that we could care about. So that's a problem that I think we all encountered, namely one piece of cake is left and two are still hungry. And if you squint your eyes, then you can see the, the answer is given away here. The first person cuts, the second person chooses, right? That's, that's the algorithm. So if two people want a cake, then the first person cuts the cake and what they perceive to be the middle, right? Or maybe they have different preferences about the cake. Maybe there are strawberries on one side and chocolate on the other side, and one person likes chocolate more. Well, then cut in in, in, a, place, in a position where they say, I don't care which piece I get. The second person chooses the one piece they get more, and no one is jealous, right? That's that's what doing it. Well, is this possible? Can you generalize this to n people? If you have all with their subjective preferences about a cake, is minus one cuts of the cake, and cake today will always be a unit interval. That cuts suffice to to get envy free partition of of the cake. Um, so dividing cake is, is the desirables they want to have. How about dividing under? Desirables. That's a, that's a dual problem. So here, you, your n minus one friends move into an apartment that has rooms, and it's an apartment that has total rent one dollar. And it has subjective preferences. So someone might prefer a balcony, or someone else might prefer being close to the fridge. Divide the rent among the rooms in such a way that everyone weakly prefers a different room. In a way, uh, so assign rent to each room so that in the world aside for different rooms, and they have a bijection from from two rooms, and jealous of anyone else is envy free way. Wait, wait. And now the theorem here. This is the article by Francis Sue from '99. With envy free cake division or rent division, they always exist for any number. Of people, unreasonable assumptions. For example, one reasonable assumption is you would prefer an empty piece of cake over a non-empty piece of cake. Or, and, uh, and of reasonableness is if you prefer a sequence of pieces of cakes and they merge to a piece of cake, they also pre prefer a limit piece of cake. Yeah. So your, your preferences are closed sets. So three problems. And I've learned, does, does this theorem tell you how to produce these divisions, or they uh, at all, or is it just an existence? Um, so for well, coming rhythm of first person cuts, second person chooses to to generalize this to more people is very difficult. But this is not existence proof. It also tells you how to find the fair division. In part, the New York Times has this algorithm on their website. So you can go to the New Times website, you can input um, your torrent, and then uh, find the, the, the fair vision of rent among the rooms for you. And it's like, if, if the rent was divided in this way, which room would you prefer? And then a bunch of these questions, and then uh, the division of rent among the rooms will be output for you. Yeah, there, there's an office. I'm teaching practices in the department, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
maybe I'll even get to the proof. It's it's a simple proof. Maybe maybe we'll get to it today. Problem: Hyperplane mass partition splitting necklaces and and these NV free cake orange divisions are the problem I I want to talk about. So let's talk a bit about hyperplane mass partitions. And so we wanted to talk about results where you use more than one hyperplane. So first interesting case maybe is, is two measures and to equipart them into four equal pieces by two planes, where this is possible. What we just showed this is possible in, in the three space. Yeah. If you have two what actually showed if you have two convex bodies in three space, then there are two hyperplanes that pack them into four pieces each. And your proof outline not of Rodriguez's proof, but of a proof they found together with my co-authors Pavel Blagojevich, Albert Hase and Günther Ziegler from, from Lenin. So do this. How can you prove this? So we're given two masses in, in three space and we want to find these two high planes that part them both. Now planes in three space are paralyzed by the three sphere up to compactification. Why is that? Well, the three you have a normal vector in S3 and this normal vector um, to a linear subspace of R4 or one. A linear subspace of R4 of co-dimension one intersects R3 if you put R3 at height one in, in a fine hyperplane. Right? Parametrization. And you're parallel to R3. So there are two two vectors that don't correspond to hyperplanes. That's why this is up to compactification. And I argue that there's an antipodal circle worth of hyperplanes that already bisect both masses, ma masses that cut them in half. Right? So well, for, one, for one mass, this is simple S2 worth of hyperplanes, and they come out from infinity, come come inwards, just move the hyperplane inwards from infinity, and immediate value theorem that you have to bisect. So an S2 worth of hyperplanes that bisect one measure, well then hopefully they intersect in a circle, these two S2s in S3. Now, so of hyperplanes that already bisect both masses, all to ensure is that one orthant has measure one over four. Because orthant up here has measure one over four, then since the planes already bisect, all orthants have measure one over four, so it's an equipartition. So what we do is we define this map here from, from the torus with, with the pairs of hyperplanes that already bisect to two. And this orthant, but it doesn't really matter which one you take, and he is the measure of this auth and is, is that one over four? Let's measure this. So if that maps to zero, then, then we have an equipartition. So let's show that this map has to map to zero. And we'll exploit the symmetries of the problem. Um, here's a Z4 symmetry. Z4 acts on pairs of hyperplanes in the following way. You change the hyperplanes and you do orientation of one of them. If you do times, you get back to where you started from. Right? So that, that's the symmetry we want to exploit. Also let Z4 act on S1 just if it were Z2. This does not hit zero, retract to S1. And that this map is constant on the diagonal. Put H1 my H1 then this mu1 of h1 plus intersection h1 plus minus a fourth. But, but the intersection is just the positive half space of h1. And h1 bisects mu1, so it has measure one half. One minus a quarter is constant. Yeah? So that's, that this constant on the diagonal, it has degree zero. Z4 invariant translate of the diagonal, take a plane, and then 90 degrees along the circle, and that second hyperplane, I can, well, that, that's a translate of the diagonal, right? You're, you're just 90 degrees off the diagonal. 
This is variant because if you switch the hyperplanes and go to the antipodal point of the other, then again, they're at distance 90 degrees. This is symmetric on this translate that our gamma here on this map is symmetric, it exhibits symmetry. The symmetry, you go from this to negative this. So precisely a Z4 equivariant map from the torus to the circle with these given actions. Maps have restricted degree modulo the order of the group if the group acts freely. And here also exhibits these symmetries. And this really has degree two, right? Z maps to Z squared is a Z4 equivariant with these actions. And degree two, but two not zero modulo four, that's a contradiction. And this, this model. Well, I guess I didn't argue that these are uh, there's a homotopy between these two. The homotopy, of course, is just this map, right? So go the diagonal to the translate of the diagonal via this map. That's the homotopy. That's why they have the same degree. But they can't have the same degree. That's that's a contradiction. So this problem for two hyperplanes was studied by lots of people. So Hugo Hardwiger first, and then Edgar Ramos, Mani Levitska, Vercica, Zhevaljevich, and then uh, most recently by by my coffers and myself, um, together, if you could result in all these papers, you at least get this that if you have masses and two hyperplanes, then you can repart them in this dimension 3 of j rounded up it is close to a power of 2. Power of power of 2 minus 1, power of 2 plus 1. Um, this is the dimension that you get from a degree of freedom count. Right? This is the dimension you would expect from a degrees of freedom count. The conjecture is it's always the dimension you get from a degrees of freedom count. Um, conjecture is open. These are the cases that, that we know are true. We don't know much more. So here, for the planes, we, we showed that, that all these two cases, it's, it's and the it just showed you, implies that for for one and three hyperplanes also have a tight result. If this is possible in R three. It's possible. So as in really quick, so you're talking about what's known and what's unknown. So so here you, you met all results with two hyperplanes. Those are all known. Is that right? Uh, yeah, to my knowledge, these are all the results that are known for two hyperplanes. But are, are there uh, so all tight results? So Ani Levitska, Vrechica, Zhevaljevich proved upper bounds for this number that are not necessarily tight. Are there questions left unanswered even with two hyperplanes? Oh, yeah. every J that's not one of these. The, the corresponding question is, is unanswered. Yeah. I see, I see, of course. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, right, and for three hyperplanes, even, even worse, right? Because it's one two or four masses where, where we have an exact answer and otherwise only on the upper bounds that, that we don't know whether they're tight or not. I see. Right. Um, and I was about to explain this. Why? why so for one is an R3, why is there an equipartition into eight equal orphans by three hyperplanes? So one is possible. Ten is an R3. Now a hyperplane that's bisecting. So this by intermediate value theorem. And think of the two halves as two new measures. Well, you count them by two hyperplanes, put together, and that's an equipartition by, by, by three hyperplanes of, the, of this mass you started out with. So j equal to one and, and hyperplanes, we also have the tight result that this is equal to three follows from work of Hugo Hartwiger. I guess that's the result that, that he wanted to show. The big open case is a conjecture of Anko Grunbaum that if you have one mass in R4, then you can repart it into 16 equal pieces by four hyperplanes. Is Well, that's possible in R5. Okay. So one of these that 
that you t plus one or two to the t or two to the t minus one uh, masses, why why do these number theoretic conditions show up? Well, I'll outline for you one one idea here. How how do you go about just just to see where the number theoretic conditions come from. So this is for two to the t plus one masses in hyperplanes, and we want to show that this is possible in Euclidean space of dimension 3 times 2 to the t minus 1 plus 2. Okay. This is not possible. And for, for this dimension, there are masses that you cannot equivalent into four equal pieces. Then you have a D equivariant map from the product of SD and SD, so two hyperplanes in D space. To of some D8 module of dimension 2D minus 1. D8 are the symmetries of the square, right? Here you have an involution, here you have an involution, and you have a flip of coordinates. That's, that's a symmetry here. And this messes that don't have an equipartition, well, can, in your model W here, you can measure the following. H1 bisect is a dimension, does a bisect as a second dimension, um, and is the is the orthant on the side plus plus. Does that have the same measure as the orthant on that is minus next side negative side? If all of them are true, then two hyperplanes bisect that measure. Now, every measure you need three dimensions. To measure whether it, it is an equation. That's why it's three times the number of masses here. Well, so that you measure in this, this module. Now, you, this mass is where you don't have an equipartition. You can construct a map that does not hit zero in this module, so you can retract to the sphere. So you have an equivariant map from here to there. And now I want to show such a map not exist for certain values. Of J. Well, if some map exists, then you can just refer to equators and up here. Well, space has agree as that space, it has the same dimension as that space, agree is well defined, and this factor through that, the degree is zero. So, is we need to construct a D8 map from here to there. Yeah, that does that has non-vanishing degree modulo eight. We're actually careful because the eight doesn't act freely on a product two spheres. The, um, the diagonal, right? The could flip just the diagonal. But yeah, you you can take care of that because any two such maps, uh, there's a homotopy on on this uh, set of non-trivial stabilizers. Take care of this. All you need to do is construct a D8 map from here to there that does not have degree that's that's eight. Yeah. Well, to construct such a map, you can just take the sixth set of measures and this map zero, right? So a specific set of measures in R D and construct the same D8 test map. Now, well, shouldn't go to the sphere. Maybe maybe it hits zero, right? Maybe, maybe there are equipartitions for your very specific set of measures. Otherwise, you'd have a counterexample immediately. And you count zeros of this associated test map on upper times the other sphere. Because, so this manifold with boundary and the that's exactly S D minus one times S D minus one. Because with signs and multiplicities, this would be the degree of, of this map. And now let's hope for the best. We hope that it's not divisible by eight. Right. Because how do we count the zeros? Well, zeros precisely correspond to equipartitions. Done. Reduce the problem of, of even A J masses division by four hyperplanes to the problem, what choose the J masses, and now just tell me 
WACRI partitions where one of the hyperplanes has a prescribed orientation. This is the upper half space, the upper half sphere. The hyperplane goes one prescribed point and has one degree of freedom less than, than, this, than the other. Okay. The set degrees of equivariant maps are congruent modulo the order of the group can be used to study one specific standard situation to understand the general picture. That's that's the idea here. Yeah. And what is this one specific picture that we want to look at? Well, put this as it's distinct intervals on the moment curve. So t, t squared, and so on, t to the d has the advantage that every hyperplane intersects it in at most d points. And now, part by two hyperplanes, an interval on the moment curve, what, what can you do? Well, it looks like this. H cuts your measure in half, and then H1 cuts both halves in half. Also, the only two possibilities. And now, completely combinatorial problem to count what instances of this exist. How, how many of purchases do you have with this configuration or that configuration? where both hyperplanes cut in at most d points. And let's keep in mind that one point of H2 is prescribed already. This, then you find that for j odd, just just a counting argument, this is 2 to j, choose j minus 1 over 2. And you take care of multiplicities and signs of, of zeros, and you see that, well, this, that this here has degree equal to the mod 8. So that is, when is this non-zero mod 8? That we have a contradiction. And here, the oldest theorem I've ever used in a paper by Cook from 1852. So when is this binomial coefficient not divisible by 4? Here you go, that if prime, in our case 2, a minimal integer k such that p to the k divides this binomial coefficient n choose m, of carries when m and n minus m are added in base p. Nope. So this is the coefficient here is not divisible by four if j is a power of two plus one. Now that, that's that's possible proof here where you see where where's, um, where this metric condition on j comes from. Well, it only works for for this specific number of masses here. Um, I think that's all I want to say about hyperplane mass partitions. I'm not sure if there are questions or comments at that point. I guess on this earlier, but um, um, people suspect that the degrees of freedom count, which gives you the correct answer in this case, is also the count in other cases. It's just that they suspect that this method of proof doesn't, you know, the proof doesn't carry over, but they suspect the same count is still true. Um, I, I know what people suspect, of course. Okay. Um, Tom, Tom and Ramos conjectured that this is true. Um, maybe my, yeah, maybe I think it's, it's false. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, so, the so is that you think there's a finite number of solutions. Are one solution or that there's can there uh, so in this tight case where the degree of freedom is equal to the number of equations you would have to satisfy to get an equipartition, in a generation you would you would expect a finite number of solutions. Of course, a solution you can always put planes and switch their orientations. I don't know if you if you want to count this as different equipartitions. Um, so I'm not asserting that there's always one solution, but the map tells you how many solutions there are. Right? We'll always have um, four or twelve or twenty solutions. Well, you know, of that, but like, I mean, there could be another that produces orbital solutions. Right. So this is something like a almost like a churn mass computation or something. There's just like, is there a way, is there, people about what could 
generic setting, if there's a, a distinct solutions module that's permutation. Mm. Other people have thought about this. I'm I'm not any any real no. I don't know if I'm interested in a numerative problem on that. Then, um, I think that, I mean, if I were to sort of the metaphor from, um, say, after bundle, you, one thing, there's a regulation of something and you get isolated solutions, but then you get a, the isolated solutions is also interesting and, and more information that, that might. We, we count the number of solutions here, right? That's that's precisely what we exploit in this in this proof. You're counting the number of solutions. So I thought you were counting, showing that. So number of solutions for this very specific set of measures. We there's a combinatory count that tells you this okay. this number of solutions. And the other set of masses, the number of solutions must be congruent to this modular weight. Okay. Um, I'll go to the splitting necklaces. Okay. Just to remind you, here's again this theorem along every class list with Q types of beads, where the number of beads of each type is divisible by k, can be fairly divided, fairly divided among k thieves. Now, as all thieves don't steal a necklace and then divide it in, in a whole lobby, they use it to some back alley and around a burning garbage can to divide the loot. So what, what happens? Well, four thieves stand around a burning garbage can and thieves cannot hand the necklace necklace to three, and two and four cannot hand the necklace to one another because otherwise they'd get burned, right? Do they have cuts of the necklace or can they still do it with the same number of cuts? So can, can we disallow certain robbers from getting adjacent pieces and here we allow empty pieces. So if, if, if one wants to hand the necklace to three, then he first hands it to two, two doesn't cut anything off and then hands it to three. And that's considered one cut. Necklace splitting for, for two. So for two, what can they do? They can, in living in three space, they can go to a universe that has Q dimensions. They put necklace on the moment curve in Q dimensions, and now there's the ham sandwich theorem that tells you that, uh, well, each type of beat as a mass. So that's the way I proved that I believe is due to Matryoshek, but I'm not so sure about it. Um, so there's a, there's a hyperplane that bisects all Q masses. This hyperplane intersects the moment curve and at most Q points, so that, that's your cut of the necklace. That's that's the Q cut of the necklace that you need to do to fairly divide this. You might worry because we the hyperplane cut speeds you have, but this, you, you can adjust that. You can correct for that. Proof for K equal to 2, then how about we try K equal to 4 using two hyperplanes? Right? So if you have four robbers, then let's assume that the number of types of beats is a power of two. So on the moment curve in the correct dimension where we know that we have an equipartition result. And now there are two hyperplanes. The auth plus plus and the auth and minus minus then adjacent to one another. The, to traverse two hyperplanes. And plus minus and minus plus. You have to traverse hyperplanes, then never adjacent to other along the no, uh, moment curve. So assign C to orthons, then proves the result for two to the T kinds of beats. That one A as well as two and four are never adjacent to one another. Just if you cut it in half, but this can, can be done. So what, what if Q power? Two. Well, take the sapphires and rubies and emeralds that you still have left from your last raid, 
and you have them to, to the end of the necklace and the power of two number of types of beads is a power of two. Now, divide among four people, you need three cuts for every type of bead here at the end. So this is uh, Q, Q is a power of two. It's the combinatorial reduction. And the theorem that, so of summer, I had a bunch of unlevels here, here work me on, on these types of I ask them this, this question. So, um, Vivek Pichiroi and Max Levy and David Stoner, Henry Sung, and, and, and Zona. So, here's the result for, for four thieves. And in the few types of beats, there exists a cyclic splitting you know, where one and three and two and four are never adjacent with cuts three times Q. Well, you generalize this, what you just said of what if k is not 4, just any number whatsoever. Well, instead of placing, so what we just did is we placed the four thieves on the vertices of a square, and we said, well, everyone shares an edge, it's not adjacent. Well, now place the thieves on a hypercube of the dimension that you can place them on, and again, impose that people who share an edge don't have adjacent pieces, and then we call it a binary necklace splitting. Yes? So, Assign C to to a bind of the of the smallest length that you can do for, then impose that two thieves that um, differ a single bit don't get don't get pieces that are adjacent. And so here again four kinds of beats. You want to partition them among three th uh, thieves, and now in such a way that one and three are never adjacent. A square and one three don't share an edge. Well, this is done in this case, as you see. Okay. And the contorial argument, again, people. So given necklace, where now you have two kinds of beads, not, not a general number of beads, just two kinds. In case, there exists a binary necklace splitting of the optimal size. And so this is. This is somewhat involved to do this. Uh, earlier, Frederick Meunier had he had a combinatorial proof of the existence of two splittings without our additional constraints. This, this is already involved, but uh, we will to, to add this. Now, this, or why do we find this interesting? We find it interesting because, well, this conjecture of Grubaum and Ramos that, that the freedom count always gives you the lowest dimension where you can can partition a number of masses with so many hyperplanes. If you can do this result, then this implies this question. Let's do this binary necklace splitting. And if k is a power of 2, we have to assign these to orthons of hyperplanes. Conjecture seems to be weaker than this Grün Ramos conjecture that seems to be very difficult to approach even, and then this seems to be a very approachable problem that you can approach in a combinatorial manner. Yeah? Count this, where is the power of two, would imply the examples to Mom's question. Uh, maybe it's provable, right? Maybe, maybe this is sufficiently simple that it is approachable, and, and it seems to me that way at least. Um, I think that that's what I wanted to say about, about splittings. Maybe there are questions or comments at, at this point. I mean, so the binary splitting means that only uh, uh, the necklace can only be adjacent to somebody else's piece of the necklace if our binary numbers differ in, in a single location. Right. Way of saying it, yes. Mm -hmm. Huh. The edges of the hypercube. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Otherwise, I'll go on. Uh, in cake division and rental harmony, um, so really is the term Francis Sue used monthly paper. Three cake divisions and rent divisions 
exist for any number of people. That that was the theorem. And actually, Su attributes the existence proof of a new free cake division to Forrest Simmons. And well, the, the reference says private communication with Michael Starbert. So I, I one of these things where someone once mumbled the proof to someone else. I'm I'm sure what the story behind this really is. Um, the this is Sperner's lemma. So here is Sperner's lemma with an with an in simplex. So here, for example, a two simplex, a triangle, and a refinement. So so a Fischer complex that refines this the triangulation of your triangle say. And vertices of by the vertices of the simplex. Yeah, so the vertices of the simplex are say red and blue, and and now you color each regulation red, blue, or green, where you condition on them. If you have green, red face, you can only use green or red. Right? These are all green or blue, and the blue or red. And in there, you can do whatever you want. Ma says, there must be a face that exhibits all colors. There's actually an odd number of faces that exhibit all colors. So here I see and so that's green, red, blue. Right, and one. Blue, red, green. Tells me there must be a third one. Here it is, red, green, blue. These these, these rainbow triangles. Proof, if, if you want to think about it topologically, just do the following, just map every vertex to the vertex of the simplex of the corresponding color and extend linearly. What that, if you don't have these rainbow faces, then you just define a retraction from the disk to the boundary sphere, wouldn't exist. That's a quick proof. But there's a combinatorial proof, and, and as Berner's point was, if you follow the combinatorial path argument here, then you get then you purely combinatorial proof of Brown's fixed point theorem, from say. Well, how do you prove envy cake division? Well, if you have a unit interval, our cake is a unit interval. If you get points, that means you have n ordered points in the unit interval, and n ordered points in the unit interval are precisely the n simplex. So your cake are parameterized by the simplex. Now, fine refinement. Such K can be associated to one of your people interested in cake. Um, you want it in such a way that each facet of your refinement sees all the people. You know, so that the one vertices of every facet are associated to 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 a person. You have one one vertex associated to every person for each facet. That's it. Start fine trying and then take a barycentric subdivision. And then the zero is associated to uh, per dimension k is associated to to person k, and by a centric subdivision, every facet that c is that subdivide each dimension. Yeah. Now here is vertex to a specific cutting of your cake. So for x, ask the owner which he would prefer if, if if we were to cut the cake in this specific way. Colored accordingly. So colors are uh, which of the cake do you prefer? Prefer an empty piece over a non-empty piece precisely corresponds to Sperner's condition. And now, what, what does that mean? Well, in each facet you see all the cake eaters, and the side is for different pieces. So if facet is really small, then up to an epsilon, the the, the NV3 cake division where everyone prefers a different piece. So the proof, and, and since Berners' lemma is you find this rainbow facet in an algorithmic way by path following, um, and also solve this NV3 uh, division in, in an algorithmic way. Here's a So for i, let i and each piece j, piece of the cake j, let cij be the subset of cuts where per i 
weekly prefers piece J. Then this is a close covering of the simplex. Close because we impose this, and covering because you have to you have to prefer at least one piece at each point. More nobody prefers empty piece means that that is uh, spanned by vertices of of a subset of the vertices of the simplex. This is contained in this union of preferences. And so vertex, if you had vertex J, say, that means you don't cut your cake at all, and you could take the entire cake to be piece J, then the everyone prefers piece J. And that's why this vertex is contained in set Cij for each i. And such with, with this condition, close covering with this condition is called a KM covering. Nasta, Kuratowski, and Masiukiewicz. And that in a KKM covering, the action of all the sets must be non empty. If the i doesn't even draw up, it's just a dummy variable that doesn't. Do so we're not interested in this statement. This statement just tells us that there's some cutting of the cake where one person doesn't care which piece they get. That's what the statement says. What we for NV free cake division is a colorful version of that. In plus one KKM coverings, for every person we have one covering now. We want to, again, correspond to, to cut the cake into n plus one parts, such that every i that exists a j, such that this point is in the preference set cij, person i prefers piece j, and no people prefer the same piece, so the, the assignment person i, oh, sorry, person i to piece j is is a bijection. And so if you if just the statement that, that we're looking for, given n plus 1 KKM coverings of the simplex, there exists a permutation such that this intersection is non-empty. And as you see, someone was kind enough to prove it for us, David, in 1984. So, uh, the students over the summer observed that, first of all, you can phrase it in this way. And secondly, someone had already proven it. It. And this this was uh, public economics journal because there's many applications in economics, and so this this was well before Francis Sue published his article, and, and this directly gives you a topological proof of envy free cake division. And and let me kind of talk to Oleg Musin, and he told me that he also uh, that this is true. The proof is very simple, again very beautiful, I find. Um, I'll just pre-mention the, the main idea here. There are two main ideas here, namely, well, assume that the CIJs are open by adding an epsilon and, and let them go to zero, and this join from the facet opposite the vertex i. Okay. And partition of unity, so each i, you take a partition of unity that's ordinate to this cover, and then since the of unity, if you write them as coordinates of a function, then to Rn plus 1, they're negative and sum up to 1, so they map to the n simplex. Take each value of those, and KKM condition tells you that each face is mapped into itself, so it's mapped on the body, their homotopy to the identity, and if that will be to the identity, this map has to be 1. Thus, it hits the Bari center. And right at the point where it hits the Bari center, you write your partitions of unity into a matrix. Since these, so colors are partitions of unity, so they sum to 1. And we have the point x0 such that rows sum to 1. So this here is doubly stochastic. Burkhoff's theorem, it's a convex combination of permutation matrices. This is precisely the statement of Burkhoff's theorem. Thus, as a permutation, well, these are non-zero, and this is precisely what we wanted to prove. This precisely means that x naught that there's a permutation that gives them the correct piece. Yes, this is as I find. So and this is this is Gale's Gale's proof. And actually, and you can generalize this to to show that uh, n among n plus one people is possible with n cuts. The preferences of one person are secret. 
Yeah, so again, about the case, two people, they had the person cuts, and the first person doesn't know what the preferences of the second person are, but the vision is possible, right? This theorem here precisely generalizes this to more people, where a set of one person is completely unknown. Perhaps it's the person whose birthday it is, and you want to cut the cake before going over to their house, right? So if if that is unknown, you can still cut it in a way that they choose the first piece, people can choose pieces, and everybody uh, is not jealous of anyone else, including the first person. Um, I guess me, let me stop here. Thank you. Any questions? I'm not hearing anyone right now. One question for you. Mm -hmm. so, so you did the difference between uh, dividing cake and dividing rent. Um, understand a little bit better the distinction between the two. So your cake, you have a single cake and you're trying to split them to pieces. For rent, you have a, a fixed number of rooms. Um, people have different preferences on how much, whether I would prefer this room over that room if if I were given two prices. Um, so <clears throat> you explain the difference as for one, you're trying to divide a positive good, the more cake, the better. And for the other, you're trying to divide a negative good, good the more I have to pay, the worse. Um, now, if, if that's the only difference, a positive good versus a negative good, it seems like you could just switch the sign of the values and maybe there's an equivalence between these problems. Can you explain a little bit more? It sounds like these problems aren't equivalent. Right. They are in some sense. It, it's not difficult to deduce them from another. Why can you not flip the sign? Because <clears throat> for rooms, you always prefer a over a non-free room. Make you always prefer NTPs over NTPs. Yeah. If you come up with your with your simex for the rent case and you color it accordingly, uh, then you don't have the Sperner condition, but you have a dual Sperner condition. I see. I see. That's the difference. Guy. I see. So the the um, if you have n people, you have n cakes of different n of different sizes, and that corresponds to the n prices that. You you would put on the room. Great. Um, right. Okay. So, so the, uh, you you get you spoke in your last section about cake, but are there analogous results for room revision? Right. This should dually give you the result that if one person is secretive about which rooms they prefer, then you can still split the rent in such a way that everyone is. is that is of anyone else. First of all, you always have somebody who doesn't show up to the meeting. <laughs> That's nice. Hey, Chris Lauren. Can you hear me? Rad is your meeting? Oh, can you hear me? I hear you, yes. Uh, I uh, just sent you a message. Uh, I'm at the beginning of the talk, so if you can send me a slide, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, see you soon at ISA. At the, at the shop. Yes. But this question about the number of solutions for the equipartition, I don't believe it was since we come to break, I guess, with science. In some cases, of course, it coincides with the total number of solutions, but I don't believe that anybody studied that series. Okay. Syria. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, hello to everybody, of course. Thank the speaker again for a very nice talk.